I'm very delighted to introduce the first of our two plenary speakers today. This is Indiji Dillon. He is the, Godels, the, the Gottsman family centennial professor of computer science and mathematics at UT Austin. He's also the director of the ISIS Center for Big Data Analytics there, and he's also an Amazon fellow. Indigit's research interests are in machine learning, big data, network analysis, linear algebra, and optimization. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley, where he worked with Beresford Parlett and James Demel. I think the way to think about his work is he works on algorithms as they relate to data science, especially large data sets, uh, including clustering problems, kernel learning problems, and he's contributed software to R, as have other people who we'll hear from later in the day, which is an important thing. Uh, he's received several awards, including uh, the ISIS Distinguished Research Award, the SIAM Outstanding Paper Prize, the Moncrief Grand Challenge Award, and the SIAM Linear Algebra Prize. He's also a fellow of the ACM, the IEEE, SIAM, and the American Association for the Advancement of, of Science. So today, Indigit is an Amazon fellow. He's on leave from UT Austin. And when Francesca and I were putting together the program for today, it was very important for us that we had somebody who could represent for us all of the promise within industry that data science presents and that machine learning more generally um, is allowing. And um, you know, I've always personally been very, when I think about the big tech firms, I've always had a soft spot for Amazon. Uh, no, no offense meant to my friends in the audience from Google and from Facebook and other places, but I've always felt that physical things are more difficult than, than, than digital things. And of course, it's not to say that Amazon is not also digital, but Amazon also moves physical things around in the world. And that makes, it's always made it especially impressive in my mind. Okay, so anyway, what does Indigy do? He works on machine learning to solve various customer problems in search. Um, we're excited to get a look at that today and see some tangible examples of the ways in which data science is transforming business. Please join me in welcoming Indigit. Okay, well, thank you for your kind introduction, uh, David. It's an honor to be here. Um, excited to hear about uh, what uh, uh, is happening in data science at various universities and in particular at uh, Harvard. Um, so as uh, David mentioned, uh, uh, I'm a professor at uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, for the past year and a half, I've been on leave uh, at Amazon Search. And uh, uh, David today asked me to talk a little bit about uh, problems that come up in the industrial setting but that have a research flavor to them. So that's what I will try and do today, okay? And so this is joint work with actually uh, some of my Amazon colleagues, a uh, couple of my UT Austin students, and a couple of students from other universities that came to Amazon to do internships. So today I'll talk about uh, deep learning and a particular research problem that comes up, a challenging problem that comes up uh, called uh, vanishing and exploding gradients when you are trying to capture long range dependencies in deep learning. I'll get to the technical part later, but let me first motivate it by some problems in Amazon. Okay, so uh, how many of you have uh, made a purchase on Amazon? Okay, this is just a way for me to check whether the mic is working. <laughs> okay. uh, how many of you have not made a purchase on Amazon? Okay. So you're probably very familiar with how the search on Amazon works when you go to Amazon's website. So this is a very, you know, very simplified diagram of how somebody might shop at Amazon's website, right? So you go, let's say to the search box, you start typing a particular query when you have a shopping mission in mind, then Amazon will provide you suggestions as you're typing, right? As you're typing IPH, Amazon might try and suggest things like iPhone charger, iPhone X, and so on. 
And you might choose to accept one of these suggestions. And then the website will show you results. Results of actual products that Amazon is selling in response to your query. And so you might be happy with some of the results. You might click on uh, a, a, a product, go to what's called the detail page of the product, okay? And you might check out if you're happy with this product, okay? You might purchase and you might check out. Or we also show different recommendations on the detail page of the particular product. You might end up taking those recommendations and this is sort of an iterative process. It's a process of discovery of what product that you want to buy and how you want to pose the, the, the question okay, to fulfill your shopping mission. And uh, you have to remember that you know, there's only one search box for all the, the pe people who come to the website. So there may be very, very specific uh, questions. So you might be wanting to look for exactly a very particular product or you might have something very gen general, like, you know, uh, Mother's Day is coming up. I want to try and buy a gift for uh, my mother. So what I'm going to try and do, so this is, uh, 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 I'm going to actually just focus on a very small subset of the system and talk a little bit about some problems that come up in what is called autocomplete or query suggestions to motivate the research problem that comes up. Okay. So like I said, uh, you know, you go to the search box, you type in IPH, uh, there are various suggestions that are made, and uh, 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 the question is, what suggestions should be made in response to what the customer is typing? Okay. The query autocomplete is uh, very integral to the search experience. It actually leads to a substantial number of requests. The search requests are actually issued on the website. But it's uh, quite challenging, right? You have to respond very quickly. There's a very low latency requirement for uh, any uh, uh, algorithm that you might want to deploy that works in uh, an online fashion. And there are various kinds of requests, right? You may have uh, uh, something very specific about watching a particular movie, or you might do have something very different like searching for uh, uh, Thanksgiving deals. So we want to try and respond to all sorts of customer requests. So there are, there, there's a, 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 a one possible approach. You know, there's a lot of traffic on the site. There's a lot of data that one can use. So one possibility is you basically just memorize what uh, uh, customers have typed. Right? So what you do is you actually construct what's called a read-only uh, database. And you have basically uh, prefixes linked to various suggestions. You may be able to even rank them on an offline manner. And uh, at the time of you get a request, you just show the rank list to the user in response to each query. So this is very lightweight in the sense of very quick to actually do, uh, uh, to make the suggestion, but it is memory intensive. Okay? You actually have to construct quite a large database. And then when you start thinking about it, this is good for a lot of the uh, queries that the site sees uh, that are very frequent, okay? But all these memorized type queries don't generalize, right? So, you know, for example, you know, if the system has not seen a particular uh, query, then there is going to be no suggestion that is made to the customer, okay? So as a result, many prefixes will not have any completion using this memory-based approach. Okay, so you know, just as an example, if you type uh, queen size sheet, then these are the different suggestions that might be shown to you. But then you might say, okay, I'm actually looking for a particular queen size sheet. And I say queen size blue, and you're thinking of like a blue cotton sheet. And then you start typing queen size blue cot. And now the system actually has never seen this particular query or this particular prefix and the memory-based approach is not going to generalize in this case, okay? So what I will talk about is, uh, you know, trying to use uh, deep learning, which has been actually very successful in modern applications like speech recognition, natural language processing, 
applications where it's very hard to capture the state, right? If you just think about these, the places where it's been successful, it's very, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, later, okay? So, for example, the deep learning model will be able to generate when uh, uh, the customer types queen size blue card using uh, uh, techniques that I will describe uh, later, queen, queen size blue cotton sheets, right? So this is a query that has not been seen by the site, but in real time, can the system, I'll describe a system that can actually generate these completions. And then of course, the website, the Amazon does carry uh, blue queen size cotton sheets, and that's where the customer can fulfill their shopping intent. Okay, so now let's move on to sort of the technical aspects. How would you go about solving uh, such a problem, okay? So uh, if you look at uh, natural language processing, uh, we can actually use probabilistic language models that people have worked on. So in particular, I can ask the question, given a particular prefix, what is the probability that a particular query will be seen given that particular prefix? Okay? So in particular, if somebody types in MIC, right, what is the probability that you, know, you will have Michael Kors handbags versus micro SD card versus Mickey Mouse? Okay. If you could have these probabilities, then you can actually make predictions. Okay. The problem is that this is a large space, so what we will do is we will use sort of you know, conditional probability. It's not that hard to see that you can then write the probability of uh, uh, you know, the query given a particular prefix as the product of seeing the next character given the current prefix. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, if you think about what kind of models to use over here, uh, there's, uh, like I said, uh, deep learning has been very successful recently in uh, natural language processing uh, applications. So one of the questions is, can you use actually sequence to sequence based models that have shown a lot of uh, uh, you know, the best uh, known results recently in uh, uh, machine translation, in particular neural machine translation, okay? So that's what we are gonna try and do. We're gonna try and use uh, deep learning such that we can actually do the prediction in uh, real time uh, fashion when uh, somebody comes on the website. So let me again uh, switch gears. Uh, to seeing what deep learning methods can be used. Okay. So uh, there are uh, these recurrent neural networks that have shown, been shown to uh, give great results in speech recognition, in uh, translation, and have great promise in things like uh, question answering. And many of these cases, uh, one of the reasons for their success is that you know, as you sort of think about speaking an English sentence or typing an English sentence as you type in words, it's actually very hard to sort of capture the state of all the words that have occurred previously, uh, let's say in a long paragraph. Right? And so you can design uh, you know, other machine learning techniques and people have done that for, for decades, uh, but then you have to be very careful about feature engineering. Whereas the promise of deep learning is that hey, you have to do minimal amount of feature engineering and, uh, and, uh, and the actual uh, technical details are as follows, right? So if you think about a recurrent neural network, the recurrent neural network is just uh, sort of a non-linear uh, dynamical uh, system. Uh, there are some linear components to it and then there is a non-linearity over here, okay? So let me just, uh, uh, go through this. So this is uh, uh, a recurrent neural network which is unrolled in time. Okay, so you can think of x1 as the input at time instant one, x2 as the input in time instant two, x3 as the input at time instant three. So in terms of our uh, 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 autocomplete problem, you can actually think of x1 as the first character that's typed, x2 as the second character that's typed x3 as the third character that's typed, okay? And what uh, 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 recurrent neural networks do is that they maintain, so x is the input, okay? So the input is fed sequentially into the system, x1, x2, 
all the way up to X capital T. And then there will be output at every step. Okay, at every step, then you may want to make the suggestion, for example, in the autocomplete example of the next character that uh, the system uh, might see. Okay? And the parameters of the system are these matrices, the W, which is called the transition matrix, uh, and M sort of maps the inputs into the same space. What is very important is that the system maintains, the recurrent neural network maintains a hidden state. Okay? The hidden state is captured by H, okay, and H keeps on changing with the each input, right? So every time you see an input xt, the hidden state evolves, and it evolves according to this equation, right? So W is a transition matrix, it changes the hidden state, and then x is the particular input, and then from the hidden state, so you can see the hidden state is evolving, and then from the hidden state, there is a, a typically a linear transform that maps the hidden state onto the the um, <coughs> the output. Okay, so so that's sort of uh, recurrent neural networks in uh, in one slide. Um, the parameters of the system are this matrix W, the hidden dimension. Th remember, this is a vector. Okay, so typically this x t is a vector. HT is also a vector. Uh, typical sizes are 1,000, 500, 512, 1,024. Things in deep learning are always, as you know, in computer science, uh, many cases, uh, powers of two, uh, because of reasons of efficiency on uh, GPUs. Uh, and uh, so, you know, typically this will be 512 or 1,024, which means that this matrix is a size 1,024 by 1,024. Okay, so that though. And so all these, para all these are parameters. Okay? These have to be figured out based upon the training data. Okay? So as is common in machine learning, what we will do is we will feed it a bunch of training data. And then the deep learning algorithm, which we will get into more detail, will try and learn these parameters. Okay? And how will it learn these parameters? Well. There will be a loss function which is specified. So typically, again, I'm now kind of recapping uh, machine learning, for example, what uh, Cynthia talked about, that uh, the loss is going to be measured, and typically the loss is decomposable in the sense that if I have uh, one particular sequence that has one output, then I can actually think of the total loss as a sum over the losses on the individual examples. Okay, so uh, 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 the loss is typically decomposable. Uh, generally, you might have two different kinds of problems. For example, regression problems. If I'm trying to do, let's say, a time series prediction, or I might want to do a classification problem where I'm trying to predict the class. And uh, you, know, you, you can employ different loss functions. Okay. So you can employ squared loss. You can apply something which is called cross entropy loss, which is just the KL divergence between two probability distributions. But then the question is, how do you actually learn these parameters? Okay, so so uh, you know these parameters W, M, uh, B, and Y. How do you actually learn these parameters? Okay, so uh, uh, a fairly simple algorithm. You know, if you are thinking of teaching an optimization course, it's one of the first algorithms that you might uh, might teach is to use something called gradient descent. Okay, so here I've sort of shown a picture of uh, level sets of a particular function. In this case, it's a convex function. That's why these level sets are elliptical. Uh, um, uh, so what you would typically do is you have a loss with parameters theta. I want to try and optimize or figure out theta based upon the training data. And what you then do is you basically update by looking at the gradient. Okay, you look at the gradient of your loss. Okay, here's the gradient of your loss. You take the direction along the negative gradient, you take a step size, and you update your parameter. Okay. So that is typically, you know, that's one way in which uh, sort of uh, numerical optimization works. Uh, uh, the problem in many, many uh, recent uh, problems that come up 
in uh, where deep learning is very effective. So one thing I should have said also is deep learning is also effective when there is lots and lots of training data. Okay, so that means the total amount of training data is capital N. Right, so N might be in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions, lots and lots of examples. The problem is that even like you know a fairly well simple algorithm like gradient descent it's very actually hard to even do one iteration of that on these large data sets. So what is typically done these days is uh, what's called uh, stochastic gradient descent, that instead of looking at all the n examples and then only make, taking a step, we can actually just look at a very small mini batch of these examples of the training data. So typically, you know, a small uh, mini batch is sampled of size capital B, and then you can do, uh, we can get an estimate of the gradient from these, uh, uh, from this mini batch, and then we can actually go ahead and do run uh, stochastic gradient descent. And then there's lots of details about how to choose the step size and so on. And again, one thing I should uh, I should uh, warn you is uh, that uh, is that. Uh, you know, this is a very nice picture. Uh, it's basically showing a convex function and the convergence is, you know, easy and so on. Uh, typical problems that will come up for deep learning, especially the problem that I talked about, it's actually very non-linear, it's non-convex, and so it's really fraught with, fraught with danger, okay? Uh, I remember when I was a graduate student, uh, you know, the, in Berkeley, the connection machine had just come out and I was, you know, programming on the connection machine doing nothing to do with deep learning or machine learning. But uh, I remember when one of my uh, uh, supervisors uh, remarked saying, oh, I'm sorry you're spending your youth in debugging uh, uh, these difficult to program machines. And I feel sympathy for the graduate students right now because, you know, you typically have to really baby these, this uh, software and the method, and it's not as simple as, hey, you know, you uh, uh, invoke a particular program, you go and get your coffee and your, you know, your, your solution, or you, you know, maybe sleep overnight and the solution appears uh, next morning, okay? It, it's not, it's difficult. And, uh, and why is it difficult? So this is the real, some of the reasons are, let me outline them. So for example, think about how you would try and estimate these parameters, right? W, B, delta. You're given uh, training data. So suppose I'm given a particular X and suppose you have some estimate of these parameters. Okay? So what you would like to know is, given my current estimate, what is uh, the prediction that the the, 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 the deep learning method or any machine learning system is making with these parameters. So you have basically a phase of what's called forward propagation, okay? So you basically feed in X, you basically run the uh, uh, nonlinear dynamics of an RNN, you evaluate the output at each step, and then you evaluate the loss function. If the loss is large, that means the system is not doing so well on this particular example, right? The parameters are not doing so well. So if, the law, if that happens consistently over many, many examples in the training data, what do you need to do? You need to change the parameters. That's what gradient descent is doing, okay? But for gradient descent to work, I need to figure out the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters. Okay, so, uh, Sorry, this is, uh, uh, yeah, there's some, there's some unavoidable math in this slide. Um, um, so what you basically do is you evaluate the loss function, okay? You look at the gradient of the loss, and then you do what's called back propagation, okay? That's one of the big, uh, you know, reasons why uh, deep learning has been successful is, because given a, a, a well-chosen loss function, which is very relevant to your particular application, okay, and given lots and lots of training data, there is basically like a very prescriptive way, somewhat automatic way of changing the parameters. Okay? And that's by evaluating the gradient using backpropagation. What that means is, well, in, my, in this example in RNNs, 
W is a parameter, okay? H is not an explicit parameter, but it needs to be used because if I look at the gradient of the loss with respect to the initial parameters, I apply basically a chain rule, okay? And uh, uh, when you apply the chain rule, you basically get the gradient with respect to the different, for example, the hidden layer. I'm in the computer science department. Uh, you know, I'm sure over here also you struggle with uh, curriculum decisions on, uh, you know, what to teach, uh, for example, undergraduates. Uh, and I remember uh, that there was a time in, uh, well, uh, you know, I think we may have even made the decision to, like, I think it was like 10, 12 years ago, to maybe not make multivariate calculus compulsory for, for undergraduate students. I think we have now like a bachelor's of arts program and a bachelor's of science. And in one case, they're not required to take multivariate calculus. Okay, well, here if you want to form your gradients, well, you need to know your multivariate calculus. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is problematic, okay? So, but what happens in this particular case is that if I look at the gradient, I basically see that if I want to, so, so these are parameters, if I have a loss function, if I want to propagate the gradient back to the first layer, what ends up happening is that you basically end up getting a very large power of this transition matrix W, okay? And when you get a large power, what ends up happening is that the gradients either become too big, that is they may explode, or they may diminish very rapidly, which means that they vanish. And that's a very fundamental problem in using recurrent neural networks, which means that the long range dependencies are hard to capture, okay? So, so this is a fundamental limitation with recurrent neural networks that gradients can easily explode or vanish and it's a well-known problem, okay? So what have people done? Uh, I think I need to speed up a little bit. Uh, uh, the typical nonlinear functions people use are sigmoid functions. So, you know, one, one problem is that you will, you can get gradient explosion, but if you really look inside, uh, uh, inside it, it actually turns out that vanishing and gray, uh, explosion can be viewed as two sides of the same coin. Because if you really look at the nonlinearities, many of these nonlinear activation functions, actually uh, the, the gradient uh, diminishes exponentially. Okay, which means that if your argument becomes large, on the next step, it'll actually become, the gradient will become very, very small. So uh, what are solutions that people have come up with? Pretty much everybody who works on uh, uh, recurrent neural networks doesn't use the dynamics that I talked about. Okay? Uh, they actually use what's called long short-term memory. Uh, and you know, if you thought that was complex, then you know you basically have these you know different forget gates and people sort of give justification for um, using these different gates. Okay, but many more parameters. Basically, four times the number of parameters that are there in uh, uh, in a simple recurrent neural network. Okay, and then people have come up with other solutions, uh, uh, something called gradient clipping, uh, and so on. And these large-scale LSTMs are actually used in practice, right? So for example, uh, Google published a zero-shot translation paper where they basically use uh, not just one LSTM, right? So I showed you the equations over here. They don't use just one. There are eight layers, okay, of LSTMs, okay? So uh, hidden dimension is 1024, there's 255 million parameters. Lots and lots of training data. Uh, even on 100 GPUs, the total training time is on the scale of weeks for these neural machine translations. So they're definitely used. Of course, they are, these architectures are being evolved, uh, uh, but, but LSTMs are, are important. So I've tried to motivate the problem more, and I'll now try and present my, the solutions to you know the, the the basic problem, right? Why is there gradient vanishing and explosion? And uh, we'll see that we can actually pull out a technique 
that is uh, uh, that's actually well known in certain community, right? So what we will say is one of the problems that happens is when you take powers of a particular matrix, the reason that the gradient will vanish when you take powers is that the eigenvalues of this matrix or the singular values might actually be less than one. And then they will diminish very rapidly. Or the eigenvalues can be bigger than one and the gradient can explode. Okay? So, so it, it turns out that we can use a technique that was developed for a, for a different purpose uh, um, uh, actually quite a long time ago, like now, now 60 years ago. So this was uh, Householder Reflections that were popularized by Alston Householder for solving some very, very basic problems that we now take for granted, right? How many of you here have gone to a software package like MATLAB or, uh, or you know, R and, you know, done either a eigenvalue decomposition of a matrix? Okay. Then you've used this. Okay. You may not know of this, okay, but you've used this, and it's actually testimony to, to the fact that it works really well that you've used it. Okay. So householder reflectors are actually very basic elementary orthogonal transformations that have you know, different properties. But what this means is that they give you a very, very stable representation of a orthogonal matrix. So what we can do is we can actually take my transition matrix. So the powers of the transition matrix are those that come up when you're trying to solve this problem. So what you can do is you can represent these so you can always maintain the singular value decomposition of the transition matrix. So as that's a solution we will do, okay? But how can we actually do it efficiently? We will maintain u and v of a singular value decomposition, which is u sigma v transpose. We'll maintain them by using these very, very stable uh, representations. And then the trick is that this will give us a handle during training to the singular values. And then we have full control over the singular values, and then we can actually modulate them during the training process. So I'm not going to go into you know, all, the, all the details, but this is what uh, spectral parameterization of the, the transition matrix is. So what we can do is, during training, we can actually use a differential tra differentiable transform, which is the key to doing back propagation. And we can basically map the singular values while training is going on to somewhere which is close to one. When, you know, when I have eigen singular values exactly equal to one, I get an orthogonal matrix. But now, if I make them close to one, don't have to constrain them to be exactly one, then I will diminish the possibility of gradient vanishing and explosion. Okay, so again, you know, there's a lot of uh, 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 detail that needs to be worked out. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail over here uh, of, the, of, the, of the different things, but suffice it to say that, you know, you have to basically be able to do the back propagation efficiently. Okay? And there is no recourse to that without actually looking closely at the form of the, uh, the gradient and doing these operations efficiently. Okay? So, you know, there are all these gradients that need to be formed uh, and then implemented on uh, a GPU. The nice thing is that this back propagation can actually be performed in time which is linear in the number of parameters. So that's all you need to know. Okay. If I did not use this very good representation, it would be I cannot do it in time linear. But because I can use these efficient transformations, then I can actually do them in time which is linear. Okay. And then it turns out I haven't, uh, you know, I motivated the talk by using recurrent neural networks. It, can actually, it turns out that you can actually always do this, right, for any deep learning network. So it doesn't have to be... Uh, it can actually be used in conjunction with LSTMs. It can actually be used for a feedforward neural network or a multilayer perceptron. Um, there, is, there is no inherent limitation to using this for recurrent neural networks. And then, uh, if you had noticed earlier, um, I had uh, uh, shown you, you know, how LSTMs uh, uh, sort of use additional gates to the recurrent neural network equations, okay? 
So it turns out that even in this case, we can use uh, gating, and actually it improves the performance uh, a little bit. So I won't, again, I won't go into the details over here, but you can actually use gating, which we call uh, singular value gating. Okay? You can informally think of that you know, traditional gating will screen out unimportant uh, uh, coordinates, individual coordinates, and this gated units will, the gated, uh, singular value gating actually screens out unimportant principal components. So they are a higher level concept than individual things. Okay, so what can we if, we, if we, if we do this process, we can provably solve the uh, uh, gradient explosion problem. Okay, and we can very, you know, we, we can mitigate the gradient vanishing problem. The reason I say mitigate because, you know, in addition to the power of the matrix, uh, there's also, which, which we can control, there's also the, the, the uh, gradient of the activation. Okay. So that's something that also, like I said, it's also mitigated when you control the argument. Okay, so, you know, as, uh, as we make progress on in uh, deep learning, machine learning, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting empirical work that's coming out in deep learning, right? Deep learning can do this, deep learning can do this, it can cook my omelet, blah, 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 right? But... What are some of the reasons why it does it? What, what can we do? So, you know, there is, for example, in the, the, the Simons Institute at Berkeley, there was a, a series of workshops that were held on, uh, you know, theoretical uh, analysis of uh, deep learning. Okay, so, and in fact, I think Peter Bartlett presented uh, one of his, uh, I think he presented his work there, but, you know, you can give some theoretical guarantees. And it turns out that the generalization of the network depends upon the largest singular value or the spectral norm of these transition matrices. Okay? So uh, Peter Bartlett and his colleagues did it for uh, multilayer perceptrons, and then we extended that analysis to, uh, to recurrent neural networks. Okay, let me come back to the, to the particular examples. So uh, how does this method work? Okay, so let me give you uh, a, a, initially a synthetic task. Okay. So the synthetic task will basically test whether you can capture long-range dependencies. So here's the synthetic task. The task that is given to the machine is that you are given two arrays of numbers, the top array and the bottom array. The bottom array is just a sequence of zeros and ones. You should think of it as a mask. And there are only going to be two ones in this bottom mask. Okay, one one in the first half of this L uh, sequence that is uh, of length L, and then one, the second, second one is in the second half. And the task is, of the, the machine, what it needs to do is, it needs to just add the numbers that correspond to the masked ones. Okay, so in particular in this case, there's a one here corresponding to 0.7. There's a one here corresponding to 0.5. The machine should output 1.2. That's the target variable. Okay? Now you can see that as my L becomes longer, right, then the, the machine needs to remember more of the state. And if you think about deep learning, what that means is that the gradients really need to be able to propagate for large distances. So let's see how uh, different methods do. So if you look at L equal to 30, you know, you can see that the test mean square error, all the methods actually do quite well. The test error goes down to zero. Okay? When you get to 100, then you can see that, hey, you know, the LSTM is, struggles for a little bit and then is actually able to reduce it down to zero. Okay? When you get to L equal to 300, then you can see that the LSTM actually saturates at a less than optimal test error. Okay? But by controlling the singular values, we call this method spectral RNN, we can see that we are able to get you know, better test errors. And if you really look at the reason behind this, and this plots below, on the y-axis I've plotted the gradient of the, the norm of the gradient. 
Okay? And what you can see is that initial, you know, for the small case, the gradients actually don't vanish. They remain 10 power minus 1. This is on log scale. And then you'll see that when, it, when you get LSTMs, the gradients actually start vanishing quite a lot. But the spectral RNN, because we designed it for this purpose, is such that it, it will get decent gradients. Okay? Similar over here. So, um, uh, so this happens is allows us to capture long-range dependencies. We've done experiments on different uh, real-world problems like speech processing. Uh, the spectral RNN works quite well. If I come back to the autocomplete task, it's a language modeling task. Uh, this is just repeating what we had done before. We actually use a two-layer LSTM or a spectral, R uh, spectral RNN. Okay? And uh, there's a lot of work that goes uh, from uh, you know, concept to actually implementing it very efficiently on a GPU so that it is competitive with things like TensorFlow and so on. Okay? So, Kudos to my student who uh, did that. I don't take any uh, credit for that. Um, but now there is, a, there is a, a public software available that actually is able to sometimes actually be even faster than, than LSTMs. And then, um, uh, you know, if you think about, some people might say, well, it's the problem with the recurrent neural network dynamics that cause a problem, right? But by using the spectral RNN, what we can show is that when we use an RNN and you increase the dimension, you actually get divergence. But by controlling the singular values, you're actually able now to get convergence using the exact same dynamics. I haven't added any extra gates. But then by, by adding more things like singular value gating and so on, then you can actually get even better performance. Okay? So in conclusion, uh, what I've tried to do is I've tried to motivate it, uh, you know, using a particular problem that comes up in industry, giving you sort of a sample example of how, you know, basic research topics may need to be uh, tackled. Uh, in particular, I've, you know, just given a particular efficient spectral parameterization of uh, uh, these weight matrices that come up in deep learning. Many of you raised your hands when I said something about IG. It just works. Uh, you know, these, these things just work automatically. Hopefully, you know, these more sophisticated concepts from, let's say, fields like numerical linear algebra can make its way to uh, modern deep learning software. Uh, coming back to the customer interactions, you know, this is just a very small part of the problem, okay? So, so when we are doing things uh, on Amazon Search, some of the topics that have been already touched upon earlier, like, uh, fairness in search, uh, they also definitely come up. So, you know, all, uh, we have sort of various interesting problems. I would be remiss if, it, if I did not sort of advertise a little bit. Uh, you know, we are looking at Amazon, uh, is looking for uh, uh, people to come and do interesting machine learning, deep learning work, all the way from internships. We are flexible whenever you want to come. Uh, uh, visitor full-time positions. Uh, I've also included a bunch of uh, uh, references in case you are curious about the actual technical content. Okay? Well, thank you. So that was great. Let me just ask one short question while we set up for the next panel, um, Indajit. Just to reflect and kind of connect this back to the earlier session. Um, in your experience when you work with Amazon people, how, how much are they grappling with trying to kind of understand what these complex models are actually doing? And what kinds of technological approaches are people using, if any, to try to grapple with that? And if I ask you to keep your answer relatively short, I know it's a very hard question. But sure. Yeah, I mean, trying to make sort of interpretable uh, predictions is, is very important. Uh, so, so in particular, for example, the discussions that were on uh, on fairness, uh, something that uh, people at Amazon are very, very interested in. Right? We make sometimes we make certain decisions, sometimes coming from a very high level, saying that hey, you know, do not use this uh, these kinds of features when we are doing uh, when we are doing, for example, search. But it'll be actually nice to to get objective measures and tests for these various algorithms. So it's definitely definitely something uh, of a lot of interest. Uh, Can you name the features that are prohibited? 
you know, you do not want to use, uh, use, for example, demographic information and so on when returning search. Right? So um, you, you, you want to make search which is, uh, you know, in some sense uh, fair and does not uh, differentiate based upon certain features. 